Good? Good, good, good. Okay. How did everybody do with your chili? Thank you, Liz. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Yeah, that's good. So we're going to have to, uh, I think next time we have our prayer nights, we're going to have to customize it a little bit so we make sure we have enough time to eat and then start our Bible study on time. Right? Yeah. It's always, well, you know. Yeah, it's his timing, not ours, right? So, case settled. All right, so, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for our time that we had with you this evening, just bringing our praises and our requests to you, Lord. You're, it's so awesome to know that you hear us, that the creator of the universe listens to our voices, and that's just so cool. We thank you for that. Uh, tonight, Lord, as we continue our study, I just pray, Father, that you would speak to us, that, that uh, as we read about David and his exploits, that... Uh, we would learn things that we can apply to our own lives. And so, Father, we want to thank you for that. Please bless our time. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would please teach us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to be in 2 Samuel 16 tonight. And uh, I want to go back just a little bit to put us into a little bit of context here. Uh, we know that... Uh, there is a conspiracy or a plot that's being hatched uh, to overthrow David and his throne. His son Absalom, we talked about Absalom last week, and he's still going to be a, a major uh, figure in, in our story as we go along. But last week we saw that Absalom was one of these guys that was really, from the outside, he looked like the perfect dude. From the outside, he looked like the perfect president. You know what I mean? If, you're, if you want to picture him you know, tall and handsome and, you know, uh, charismatic, uh, got along with the people really good. And, and, and it would kind of look like, you know, well, he asked his father if he could come back to Jerusalem and he granted him that request. But the whole time, Absalom is plotting against his father. Um, and we've seen this many, many times in Scripture where the children turn against the parents. Uh, and once again, we can honestly say that David, he didn't do a very good job raising his kids. As a matter of fact, he was negligent in raising his kids. I think he got so busy with war and battle and, uh, yeah, politics and all the stuff that he was into that, you know... Uh, the kids did not get the attention they deserved. And, and plus, the other factor here is that because of what happened with Bathsheba, part of God's punishment on David was that there was going to be blood in his house. There was going to be strife in his family. And that that was something that was going to carry on down through generations to come. And so we're seeing some of that begin to unfold now. Um, why was Absalom exiled? Well, he was exiled because he killed the, the guy that murdered, that raped Tamar. And so he thought he would take matters into his own hands, uh, which was not appropriate. And now, after many, many years, um, we find Absalom back in Jerusalem. David, let's start in... Uh, David's, David's on his way up to the Mount of Olives. It's interesting to me when we look at this in chapter 15, verse 30. Um, David is going up, he's climbing up to the Mount of Olives. Now, this is hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus ever comes on the scene. The, the, the Jews are going to go through all kinds of different transitions um, throughout history until the time of Christ, and then we find Jesus, where does he wind up praying at, right before his death? At the Mount of Olives. Uh, so, I guess olive trees live a really long time, you know. They, they can be ancient. I suppose you can, I hear you can still go over there today and um, see the same olive trees there in the, 
uh, on the Mount of Olives. They're still there. So David, let's look at verse 30, and I'm going to start there uh, to get us into context. Verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 30. David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives, and he wept as he went up. And he and his he had his head covered, and he went barefoot. And all the people who were with him, they covered their heads as they went up, weeping as they went up. And someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And so it happened when David came to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God, there was Hushai, the archite, coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. And David said, If you go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously. So I will now also be your servant. Then you may defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. And do you not have Zadok and Abathar the priests there with you? Therefore, it will be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall tell to Zadok and Abathar the priests... And indeed, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimaaz, uh, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abathar's son. By them you shall send me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, went to the city, and Absalom came to Jerusalem. So David has been dethroned. David is leaving Jerusalem in, in, in shame. His head's covered. He's barefoot. He's weeping. All of his royal people are going with him and they're weeping and it's just a very terrible terrible thing but yet David is setting up here to where he's going to be able to have an informant if you will to keep him um, abreast of the situation what's going on in Jerusalem with with his son so chapter 16 starts out it says when David was a little bit past the top of the mountain there was Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys, and on them two hundred loaves of bread, one hundred clusters of raisins, one hundred summer fruits, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, What do you mean to do with these? So Ziba said, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. The bread and the summer fruit is for the young men to eat. And the wine is for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. And then the king said, And where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is staying in Jerusalem. For he said, Today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. So the king said to Ziba, Here, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I humbly bow before you that I may find favor in your sight, O Lord, my King. Now when David came to Baruchim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. Coming from there, he came out cursing continuously as he came. And he threw stones at David, and all of the servants of King David, and all of the people and the mighty men who were on his right hand and his left. Also Shimei said thus when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom your son, so now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. So we got three things going on here. We've got Abish, uh, we've got uh, Absalom, I'm sorry. We have Absalom usurping the throne of David. Now David is still rightly the king. God did not depose him from the throne 
This was a conspiracy by his son. And now David is leaving in shame and fear because Absalom's acu- uh, accumulated such a following that it could cost David and his household their lives. So they're pretty much running for their lives. They've been kicked out pretty much. Now, this other fellow, Mephibosheth, you might remember him. He was the only survivor of Saul's family. So truly, Mephibosheth was the heir to the kingdom, to the throne of, of, of Jerusalem through the line of Saul. So there's, there's what's going on with Absalom, that coup's going on. And then over here you got uh, Saul's bloodline still trying to get the throne back to give it back to Saul's kids. So there's this infighting going on. Um, there's, it's a pretty long journey. I don't think David really knows where he's heading off to. So this, this Ziba guy <clears throat> uh, shows up with all these great provisions. Um, you, can, you know, I read how, many, how much stuff he brought with him. Um, what did he say? Uh, the donkeys are for the king to ride on. First thing I thought about was, you know, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he came in on a donkey. That's a humbling thing, you know, you sit side saddle on a little donkey, you know. It's not like riding a horse of triumph and victory, you know. It's more like a picture of defeat, um, humility, if you will. And so David and his house is given these donkeys. You know, Ziba's trying to provide comfort and provision uh, for David and his family. And so here comes this guy, Shimei. I think that's how you would pronounce it. And Shimei, I believe it is. Uh, and Shimei is a direct descendant of Saul. So you got double evil going on here. You got uh, Absalom and his counterfeit goodness. And over here you got Saul's bloodline, uh, who God rejected flat out. And uh, who's the accuser of the brethren? Who's the one that stands before the Lord and says to him, that guy over there is not worthy to be in your family, God? Who does that? Satan does that. Okay? He always stands against God's people and accuses them um, of unworthiness, reminding God how unworthy we are. I think God already knows how unworthy we are. I think he understands how frail we are. Well, I think he knows how easy it is for us to falter. And I think that that's a huge reason why Jesus came, isn't it? Right? Jesus came to fill that gap for us. He came to stand, in the, he came to stand as a mediator between us and the Father. So here we have another picture of Shimei accusing David. Now, his accusations, well, they're not lies. They're kind of true, actually. He was a bloody man. He did take out a lot of people. He was a warrior. He was a great warrior. Um, but look at Shimei calls him a bloodthirsty man and a rogue. In other words, you're an imposter. You have no right. The right really belongs to my bloodline, to the house of Saul. And God has brought all these terrible things upon you because you took the throne from the house of Saul when Mephibosheth should be on the throne instead of you. And now your son is on the throne. So Abishai is there, the son of Zeruiah, and he says to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? I mean, who is this low life? Who does he think he is coming down the mountain and just showing up and throwing stones at us as we're trying to leave town and shouting all these curses at us? He says, who is this dead dog cursing the king? He said, let me go over there and take off his head. Yeah, I'll stick up for you, Dave. I mean, you know, you've made some mistakes, but you're still God's anointed. You're still the one that God put on the throne. And this guy is mocking you. He's disrespecting you. He's accusing you. And uh, Abishai looks at him and calls him a dead dog. In other words, he has no bite. He has no power. He has no authority. He's just a dead dog. 
He's just like Satan. He's just standing there. He's already defeated, and he's cursing, and he's accusing David and his family. Let me go over there and whack off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and all of his servants, See how my son who came from my own body seeks my life? How much more now may this Benjamite, speaking of uh, the guy that's cursing him out, let him alone, let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. And it may be that the Lord will look upon my affliction, and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went along the road, Shimei went along the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went. He threw stones at him, and he kicked up dust. And now the king and all the people who were with him became weary. So they refreshed themselves there. So this guy is taunting them all the way down the road. You can almost see it in your mind, you know. He must be a crazy man. He's cursing, he's yelling, he's screaming, he's throwing stones, he's kicking up dust. He's really causing a big scene. And isn't it interesting that David just says, you know what, let him go. Just let him go. You know, I blew it. I made big mistakes. And, and, and a lot of what he's saying and these curses and the words he's using are true. And he is a Benjamite. And he does come from Saul's bloodline. And so we have a double threat. My son Abishai and this Benjamite. Both of them are after David. So let him alone. God has ordered him, or I think that word ordered there could be more allowed him. Okay? He has sanctioned it, in a sense, that this uh, uh, Shimei should follow along and curse David. It's, this is all part of what um, David's folly has brought on his own self. And, and that's said right here. You brought all of this on yourself, David, because of what you've done. It just shows you that we're accountable for everything that we do. And the things that we do and the choices that we make, they could have far-reaching ramifications, I think is the word I want. Generations could be hurt because of some of the choices that people make. You know, we see it all the time. And David was told that that would be the case. So, you know, David, I think, as we were looking at how dastardly he was earlier, and we were talking about some of the things that he did, and we were saying, boy, he's, he, he, he really had a bad streak. He, he really did some things that were uh, ungodly. But yet God said, this is a man after my own heart. So what are we looking at here? Is God still working with David? Is he still molding David? Has he allowed David to rise up in pride and a sense of self-importance only now to find out that it was folly to do that? That he should have remained humble? He should have remained the shepherd boy, the shepherd boy king and humble before God. But David started thinking that he was really about something, right? That maybe a little bit uh, of an attitude of, I deserve it, you know? Uh, I should have these things, and, and uh, I'm entitled to these things. Entitlement. It's a scary thing. But now David, reality has set in on him. And now he sees that his enemies are attacking him from every side. You get into the Psalms where David is writing about these um, incidents here that we're reading about right now. And he talks about his enemies pressing in on him, asking God to deliver him from his enemies, to destroy his enemies. Um, 
the man, I think, was finally broken. I don't know about you, but I am convinced that in some way or another, until we come to a place in our lives where we don't think of ourselves so highly anymore and we're broken. We're broken in spirit. We're, we're broken in, in our self-worth. We're, we're broken in how we look upon ourselves and maybe what we've done and, and how we've lived. And that's when God can start working in a person's life. And I, I really think that I don't know how you were broken, but I really do believe that part of having a relationship with Jesus is that breaking process. Coming to the end of you, right? Coming to the end of yourself, finding that you're drowning in the waters of your own selfishness. And that's when, when we really truly cry out to God. And I think this is kind of what David's experiencing right here, and he knows it. And, and he's just saying, you know what, whatever, man, whatever God wants to do, let it be done. And if this guy's part of it, then just let him go. So now David is leaving town. They've been marching for quite some time. He's weary, and they stop and they camp and they refresh themselves uh, uh, they're coming down the hill of the Mount of Olives. So verse 15, meanwhile, back at the ranch, right? Absalom and all of the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem. And Ahithophel was with him. And so it was when Hushai, the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king! Long live the king! So Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend? Why do you not go with your friend? What happened to David? Why aren't you with him? Why aren't you being loyal to him? And Hushai said, No, but whom the Lord and these people and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. So it doesn't matter if it's you, Absalom, or if it's another guy, or if it's your father, whoever's on the throne, I'm going to be allied, allied with them. I'm going to serve them. Verse 19, furthermore, whom should I serve? Should I not serve the present in the presence of his son, as I have served in your father's presence? So I will be in your presence. I'm changing my allegiance from him to you. He's getting himself inserted into Absalom's confidence here. So Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give advice as to what we should do. Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. And all of Israel will hear that you are abhorred or hated by your father. And then the hands of all who are with you will be strong. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. Now the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was this was if uh, one had inquired at the oracle of God. And so was the advice of Ahithophel, uh, both with David and with Absalom. This guy was considered a prophet, a man of God, a very special uh, anointed man. So Absalom is very interested in what he has to say, very interested in the strategy strategy um, that he's trying to bring about. Now, talk about humiliating. Talk about the finishing touch, right? Um, you know, there might be a little smoldering of smoke of David's power still there. We're going to snuff that out completely by humiliating him, by having Absalom set up a tent 
and bring in all these women and have sex with them um, to humiliate his father. And really to make a statement of saying, I'm the one that's in authority now. So, I'm going to move to 17 here. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and weak, and I will make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. And then I will bring all the people to you. When all return except the man you seek, all the people will be at peace. And the saying pleased Absalom and the elders of Israel. So Absalom said, Now call Hushai, the archite also, and let us hear what he says too. And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. So here's David's ally, Hushai, says to Absalom, The advice that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. For, said Hushai, You know your father and his men, that they are mighty men, and they are enraged in their minds, like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. And your father is a man of war, and will not camp with the people. Surely by now he's hidden, in some pit or in some other place. And it will be when some of them are overthrown at first that whoever hears it will say, there's a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. And even he who is valiant, whose heart is like a heart of a lion, will melt completely. For all of Israel knows that your father is a mighty man and those who are with him are valiant men. You don't know who you're going up against. My father is a tough guy. David's a warrior. His men are mighty men. You think you're just going to roll into camp and just take over and kill David? Not going to happen. As a matter of fact, he's probably in protective custody right now. He's being hidden somewhere to protect him. And I'm sure his mighty men are all there keeping a watch. So if you decide to go down there at this time, you're going to be making a big mistake. You will not accomplish your goal. Therefore, verse 11, I advise that all of Israel be fully gathered to you, from Dan to Beersheba, like the sand that is by the sea for multitudes, and that you go to battle in person. And so we will come upon him in some place where he may be found. And we will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground. And of him and all the men who are with him, there shall not be left so much as one. Moreover, if he is withdrawn into the city, into a city, then all of Israel shall bring ropes to that city. And we will pull, down, pull it down into the river until there is not one small stone found there. So Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The advice of Hushai the archite is better than the advice of Ahithophel. For the Lord has proposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. So, the, the con is in, right? So Hushai in verse 15 says to Zadok and Abathar, the priest, uh, Thus and so Ahithophel advised Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus, and so I have advised. So he's rehearsing all of this to these priests. Now therefore sin quickly and tell David, saying, Do not spend this night in the plains of the wilderness. But speedily cross over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. So, Hushai is trying to warn him ahead of time of what's, what they're planning, what their plot is. He wants them to 
cross over as quick as they can. Don't, don't camp out in the open out there, uh, lest they come upon you. Now Jonathan and Ahimaaz stayed at En Rogel, for they dared not be seen coming into the city. So a female servant would come and tell them, and then they would go and they would tell King David. Nevertheless, <laughs> a lad saw them and told Absalom. But both of them went away quickly and came to a man's house in Beru Beruam who had a well in his court, and they went down into it. So they're hiding down in this little well from Absalom. They've been discovered by this woman telling on them. And when the woman, then the woman took and she spread, or I'm sorry, but the lad, uh, informant, if you will. Uh, and so the woman covers the well's mouth and she spread grain on it. And the thing was not known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? The woman said to them, they've gone over the water brook. And when they had searched and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. Now it came to pass after they had departed that they came up out of the well. And they went and they told David and said to David, Arise and cross over the water quickly, for thus has Ahithophel advised against you. So David and all the people who were with him arose and crossed over the Jordan. By morning light, not one of them was left who had not gone over the Jordan. Now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and he arose and he went home to his house to his city and then he put his house in order and he hanged himself and he died and he was buried in his father's tomb he was uh, exposed he was afraid that he was going to be caught and tortured and whatever fears he had he decided that uh, it would be better if he uh, just hanged himself and uh, so was the end of Ahithophel and his bad advice that he gave the king. So David went to Mahaniam, and Absalom crossed over the Jordan, he and all the men of Israel with him. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the army instead of Joab. This Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Jithra, an Israelite, who had gone in to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, the sister of Zariah, Joab's mother. You try to sort that one out. So Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. And it happened when David had came to Mahaniam that Shobai, the son of Nahash from Rabbah of the people of Ammon, and Mikar, the son of Amiel from Lodabar, <laughs> and Barzillai, the Gideite from Ragalam. Where did I get these names anyway? Gee whiz. What happened to Bob and Sam and Dave and, you know. Anyway, they brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley, and flour, and grain, and beans, and lentil, and parched seeds, and honey, and curds, and sheep, and cheese of the herd for David and the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry, and weary, and thirsty in the wilderness. So that's where we're going to park it tonight. There's another person. Now, you know, you remember before David was the king that most of his life he spent running from Saul. And now he's been reigning on the throne for quite a while and now he's been uh, run out by Absalom. And now he's running away again in the wilderness 
from his own son, and they find a place to encamp here in the land of Gilead, um, or uh, Mahanium, wherever that is, I have no clue. But obviously the people there were very supportive of David and his plight that he was going through. And so God provided for him, really in a miraculous way when you look at this, um, They brought beds. That's pretty wild, huh? You don't have to sleep on the ground. You guys can sleep on a bed. That's pretty cool. And basins so that they could wash themselves. Earthen vessels, containers. They brought wheat and barley and flour and all these things they brought. Beans and lentils, honey. All of these things they brought for David. And for the people who were with him. Now, there's not a small amount of people with David. There's a lot of people with him. He's got quite a following still. Um, As a matter of fact, uh, without going into the next chapter, but if you look at verse 1, David had numbered the people who were with him, and he set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds. So there were a lot of people there that needed beds and basins and grain and wheat and flour and honey and all the things to sustain them, to uh, keep them healthy, to keep them strong. Now, when I read through here, I did not really take a lot of time to unpack um, this uh, couple of verses here with all these different names and you know, the who's who of the group here. So if you want to look at that, you'd look at that on your own time. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'll find a lot of very interesting things in there when you look at them. Um, you know, the, the conflict between Israel and um, their enemies, it goes way, way, way back to Abraham and Abraham's sons. Um, even to this day, that's what this conflict is all about over in the Middle East. It's still about Abraham. It's still about who really is God's people, right? That's what they're fighting over. That won't be rectified until Jesus comes back. But we see that all of these different, uh, well, you remember Amalek. When, when Saul was supposed to go out and take care of that guy and he didn't finish the job, he came back and haunt, he'll continue to haunt the Jews all the way down through history. All the way to the time of when they're taken into captivity into Babylon. Those, that, that family bloodline will still be uh, playing a role. So seeing how these little stories that we're looking at right now are spawning all kinds of different directions that history is going to go. It's an amazing thing to see how accurate um, God's Word is. So when you do start, if you wanted to do uh, Am- Amasa, who was he? You can investigate that and find out. But he put him in Joab's place. Now Joab was David's commander. Who was that? Um, And so Absalom didn't trust Joab, so he puts another guy in Joab's place. But this guy, Amasa, we have no clue who he is or where he came from. Uh, It looks like he came from an illegitimate relationship of some kind, and uh, he was somehow related to uh, Joab's mother. I don't know, strange stuff. All of these different family groups, all of these, uh, some of them, they continue to play a role. Some of them you never hear about again. You only see one mention of them in here. So next week, we'll continue on in this book <clears throat> of Second Samuel, and we will see what happens to Absalom and what happens to his army and... Uh, what happens to David. 
it'll it'll get more interesting as we go through here so let's go ahead and pray and we will close it out for the night <clears throat> heavenly father thank you for our time and i know just sitting and reading your word and uh, just making observations of what we see here uh, it is a blessing lord it is it's it's fun to do that and we thank you that we have your word we have accurate history um, and that we can see how uh, down through the generations it, these 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 family lines they they remain uh, playing a role in history even to the present day um, so we thank you for your word we thank you for this record that we have uh, concerning David and uh, thank you Lord that uh, we were able to see uh, for ourselves tonight how important it is that we would surrender ourselves to you that we would be humbled before you and Lord if you see fit if you think that you need to turn up the heat I just pray God that we would be submissive enough to allow that in our lives Lord, that we would trust you that much. Uh, we don't like hard times. We don't like pain. But sometimes it brings us closer to you. Uh, sometimes it cooks out all the dross in our lives. It brings us back to our first love. Uh, so we trust you that much, Lord, that if you choose to do that with anyone in this room or in this church, God, uh, we want you to have your way in our lives. We want to be humble before you. We don't want to be self-serving. We want to be able to see things from a much bigger picture. So have your way with us, Lord. You're the potter. We're the clay. In Jesus' name, amen.